I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, oh There's nothing Nothing is better than you And I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley and there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies Turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Oh, you're the only one who can And there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you oh, There's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better Welcome to the Oakham Church Podcast. This podcast is for people who can or can't, for whatever reason, come to church. Either way, we'll bring church to you. Each week, it's about transforming the Sunday message into a weekly conversation. 
we've got more time to go deeper on the themes and we can take time and make the space to unpack issues that are highlighted each week. Each week on the podcast, there'll be things to think about and pray about and live out Monday through Saturday. There'll be opportunities to email your thoughts, your ramblings and your questions that we can address on the pod. We'll have interviews, discussions, testimonies and devotionals. So please subscribe to Oakham Church Podcast and share it with your family and friends. I'm Pastor Stephen and you take care, be safe and God bless you. On the following day, they drew near Bethany at the Mount of Olives, no more than a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Jesus called to himself the sons of Zebedee and pointed towards a tiny village opposite Bethphage. This for Judas was the only disappointment in an otherwise perfect day, that Jesus had not chosen him. Go into that village, Jesus said to James and John, and you will find a colt tied up on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks why you're you're taking it, simply say, the Lord has need of it. Judas watched them walk into town. Even at that distance, he saw the colt that they untied. Some people stopped them and asked a question. But when the brothers pointed uphill toward Jesus, they let them go again. Then here they came, leading the colt. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Therefore, he was the one who showed the disciples, no, he showed the entire multitude what sort of demonstration should now erupt around his master. He tore off his robe and threw it over the back of the colt. Simon saw that. He grinned and did the same. So did Matthew and Mary Magdalene. They heaped the colt with a humble saddling. Then James and John lifted Jesus himself and set him on the animal. And Jesus began to ride. The king. He was riding towards Jerusalem. As he went, more and more people threw their garments down in the road before him. It became a carpet of clothing and praise. People ran back to groves of trees and cut branches, then rushed forward and spread them also in the way. A vast laughing multitude surrounded him now, some running ahead, some following. Excitement raced from heart to heart like fire in a dry field. They shouted and sang songs. Then, as they were descending the mount to the gates of Jerusalem, the voices of thousands of people all became one voice, one massive music, singing, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Judas was delirious. The city gates began to pour forth another mass of people equal to the first. Those who came out converged with those who were coming in, so the singing was doubled and the roar of it cracked the high blue vaults of heaven. It seemed that all Judea was spiralling down to this sole place for the praise of Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, what a mighty army! Now truly the very legions of Rome must tear off their griefs and beg for mercy. As I said, we're going to be looking at this story that would normally uh, be considered um, Palm Sunday. Uh, so I'm going to read the, the story from the Bible as the, uh, the retelling that was just on uh, was a uh, slight kind of um, elaboration on that. So uh, from Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone has anything, if anyone says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and, ch and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray now as we come to your word, Lord, that you will speak to us. As we come to this issue of peace, Lord, that you will teach us, that you will reveal to us, that you will show us something new about you, show us something new about ourselves, Lord, show us something new about us, each other, Lord, that we may um, lean in closer to you, that we may grow towards you and grow towards each other in love. God, we love you, and we want to hear from you now. Um, yes, I think it was yesterday. I kind of shocked myself and probably also my family as well. Where it's around the dinner table again. Uh, we were casually sitting around the dinner table eating our tea, and um, discussion got round to politics, as you can imagine, as every discussion that everybody has in the entire world at the moment eventually gets to politics. And we hit a certain topic, and all of a sudden, this, I don't know what it was, this vehement kind of rage kind of all spilled out of me in, the, in about 30 seconds and then was done again. I just kind of looked around and looked at Janine and Leah and they both looked at me like, where did that come from? And I'd shocked them and I'd shocked myself and I, I just didn't know where, this, I didn't know I felt this way, I didn't know where this anger or this kind of, this passion came from. And so, Jumping back to last week, I used my emotions wheel, my feelings wheel on my phone, and obviously that was anger, so I found anger and went through into the, the deeper levels of that, and, and kind of realised that it was frustration and it was disappointment. Now, a lot of things have been cancelled during the pandemic, hasn't it? Has anyone had any plans that have been slightly put on the back burner over the last few months? Yeah, people have missed holidays and events and maybe weddings and, and all sorts of other things. Lots of things that we've been looking forward to. And now, all of a sudden, we feel a bit disappointed uh, because things have been cancelled. Uh, we've all experienced this, I would have thought, in one way or another. Maybe even it's just down to the fact that church has been shut or church isn't the way that it used to be. I read an online article recently that was based around the science of disappointment. And it started off by saying that disappointment, that, that feeling of being let down, is one of life's toughest emotional experiences. It shouldn't really come as a surprise to most of us here, but you, you don't really need to read an article or have a journalist tell you that that's true. We all know that, don't we? We all feel that. This, these experiences of disappointment and disillusionment, we know what that feels like. But what this article then went on to say was that when we feel disappointed, when we feel let down, and it isn't just an emotional reaction, even though it might feel like it is, it's actually a physiological one as well. See, that, that kind of punched in the stomach feeling that you get sometimes when you've been let down by someone or something. That feeling that you get is actually linked to a physical chemical in your body called dopamine. You may have heard of dopamine before. Dopamine is released and it's released by the body and it gives your brain pleasure. It's what's released by your body whenever you have any kind of positive experience in your life. The scientists have even proved that we get these, when we get these little um, alert, alerts or these little pings and stuff on our phone that tell us that um, a Facebook post has got a like or someone's just retweeted us 
photos, or like Instagram photos, or a heart on it, and you get that little alert sound. Every time that happens, dopamine is released into our bodies. But dopamine, it turns out, is way more than just something that makes us feel good. See, our bodies have got very, very clever over these thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and they can actually predict what it is that's going to make us happy, what it is that's going to give us that dopamine hit in the first place. And so then our bodies will kind of chase after that thing that it believes is going to give it that fix. So we get a fix before we get the thing that makes us happy. Our body feeds us a little bit of dopamine to make us then chase after the thing that it believes is going to give us the actual dopamine hit. And here's why, so what it says in the article, the human brain has expectations. Expectations about the future, about our hopes, and about our desires. But it doesn't just stop there. The brain is kind of like a supercomputer, and it collects and stores all this kind of data over, over the years and through all different experiences that we have. Lots and lots of information about the past, things that have already happened that were good in our lives. And then the brain expects that if we do that thing again, or experience that, whatever that is, again, we're going to get the same effect again and again and again. It's how habits are born. And so the brain kind of carves these pathways, these rivulets in us to kind of expect, expect certain things to happen, to predict things, to decide that a certain thing is going to happen in a certain way, and that will have a certain effect. And so these dopamine levels in our body start to rise just in anticipation of something that hasn't even happened yet. And then if and when that thing does happen, then you get a second hit of that dopamine as a kind of reward for doing the thing that your brain thought it should do in the first place. There's a good boy. That's what it's like. The brain is in charge and the body just follows after like a good little dog. But the question is, what happens when things don't go the way we expect? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but life doesn't always turn out the way we planned, does it? People hurt us. People leave us. People let us down and disappoint us over and over again. And when that happens, we experience what researchers are calling a reward prediction error. It even sounds kind of like a computer thing, doesn't it? Very uh, technological. A reward prediction error. Where, yes, you get that kind of first little hit, that anticipating dopamine hit before, but then you don't get the second thing that your brain was expecting. And so then all of a sudden your levels drop, you crash. And they don't just drop to where you were before, they drop even lower than when we started. We end up feeling worse. It's this kind of double whammy where we don't just feel rubbish for not getting what we wanted, but we also experience almost like a pain, a physiological pain, because we were wrong. Losing, it turns out, feels way worse when it's not what we were expecting to happen. And reading this story in Matthew 21 shows us one of these reward prediction errors. This could be, in fact, the biggest dopamine crash in the whole Bible. You see, at this time of year, within the city of Jerusalem, it would have felt very, very different. Because normally in Jerusalem, it's home to about 40,000 people. Uh, that's the population of Block Switch, apparently. Don't know whether you can envisage that in your brain. Or if Villa Park was full to capacity. I don't know to those two which one's easier to imagine. I can't even imagine Villa Park full to capacity. Sorry, that was a difficult one. Um, but at this time during Passover, Jerusalem's population is more like 400,000. Not 40,000, 400,000 which is more like 
Bristol. Yeah. All the people of Bristol in one go is. Or Wembley Stadium, filled to capacity, four and a half times. That's quite, that's quite a lot of people. Now instead of quietly and kind of unassumably um, slipping into the city unannounced, Jesus does something different. Sends a couple of his followers into the city to go and fetch a donkey. And then Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem, this city that we're told kills prophets and stones truth tellers and executes troublemakers. Jesus faces that city and Jesus rides down through the Kidron Valley on this donkey. And when these people in and around Jerusalem see Jesus, see this figure coming into this city, riding on this donkey, they go crazy. They go nuts. They get excited. They start laying their cloaks and their clothes down on the ground, making like a, a royal carpet. They start stripping the leaves off palm trees and laying those down as well, or waving them in the air. And if all of that wasn't enough, they start shouting and chanting and singing these Passover songs. Matthew even goes so far as to describe the city as being in turmoil. This word basically means like an earthquake. This city was rocking. The noise and the buzz and the excitement and the anticipation and the atmosphere of the whole feeling of this place was shaking the entire city. This story starts with this expectation. But why? Why is this scene that's in kind of opening up in front of them such a big deal to these people? Well, Matthew is writing his gospel to Jews, and he wants this Jewish audience to start to connect some dots. See, all the way through the Hebrew Bible, these clues have been being dropped. And Matthew now, through this story, is trying to get the, the hearers of this story to start to connect the dots, to get to the conclusion that he wants them to get to. Now they're dots that we, as Gentiles, don't even know our dots, let alone how to start connecting them. But Matthew here drops us four little breadcrumbs within this story that are hopefully going to help us out. The first breadcrumb is the mention of the crowd. Now John's version of this story, so all four of the Gospels tell this story, but John's version of this story goes through a town called Bethany, and that's where um, Jesus resurrected his friend, Lazarus. And so the people who follow Jesus into Jer Jerusalem and the people that are already there would have all heard about what happened between Jesus and Lazarus on this previous encounter. And so this crowd, after hearing this story about bringing Lazarus back to life, their dopamine levels would already be starting to rise. That the one who brought someone back from the dead to the world of the living is coming now. And their brains are starting to predict the patterns of if and then. If God did this, if God intervened in the life of Lazarus, then God can do it in our lives too. Now this expectation is natural. These people in this crowd are all humans doing what all humans do. That Jesus has come to step into their collective story, their story of being oppressed and being stamped on and being marginalised and being occupied by the Roman Empire. That Jesus is coming into that story to resurrect them, to save them. And that anticipation, that prediction is going on within those brains in the crowd. He's come to resurrect God's people in God's city. So that's the first breadcrumb, the crowd. Second breadcrumb are the palm branches. Now, Judas Maccabeus, 200 years earlier, had entered this same city, the city of Jerusalem, and the people had done what? They waved palm branches and they sang songs and hymns. Now, Judas Maccabeus led a revolt against the Assyrians. They were the empire that was, had their boot on the necks of the Jews at that time. 
And the people yeah. wave these palm branches because Jews, Maccabees, and this re revolution army got rid of them. They actually won. They liberated the city. They restored the temple. They made Jerusalem great again. And there was peace in that city for about 100 years. But then along comes the Roman Empire and they take over. So these people have heard all about how God intervened. Not only has the crowd heard about what happened with Jesus and Lazarus, but they're going back now 200 years in their own history about how God had intervened and sent this saviour, Judas Maccabeus. And now God is doing it again through this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And their dopamine levels rise again at the prospect of this new sheriff in town. Third breadcrumb, the song. We're told they sing, Hosanna to the son of David, and bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this song is part of a selection of psalms called the Hallel. And there were the group, this group of psalms that were sung at the beginning of Passover every year. Now, if you read all of the psalm that this little phrase is taken from, which is Psalm 118, the psalmist talks about the enemy being like swarming bees, and then God sweeps in and wipes the enemy out. It's this song about rescue and this waiting for restoration, this anticipating. Now, Hosanna is a bit of a weird word because it's not actually a word, it's three separate words squashed together. Hosanna just means Lord, save now. They're asking Jesus to do what the psalmist promised in Psalm 118. They're asking Jesus to drive out their enemy, to keep the Romans out of Jerusalem. And this phrase, son of David, takes everyone back to those glory days of Israel, when everyone was united under one king, David, and there was peace in that nation. They're longing for the good old days. So they're all watching what's happening and they're singing this song and again the dopamine levels are getting higher and higher and higher in anticipation. And then we get the fourth red crumb, the donkey. And again, quite helpfully quoted from Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9, Matthew here uses the passage uh, that, that most people during that time would have known and would have been waiting for as well. Look, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. And that night, I'm sure there would have been excited whispers going around dinner tables. Could this be it? Maybe this is who we've been waiting for? Could this mystery donkey rider be Messiah? And the crowds and the palm branches and the psalms and the songs and the donkey are all factoring into these sky-high levels of dopamine in that crowd. And all these assumptions about who God is move the people into expectations about how God should show up. And doesn't this happen the same way for us today in our lives? Where we make all kinds of assumptions about the who of God and that draws us and leads us to have these expectations about how God is going to work and how God is going to move in a particular situation or how God's going to act in our lives. I said at the beginning we were thinking about peace and the Hebrew word for peace is shalom which of course means way more than just peace, it's about wholeness and completeness and unity and order and everything in its right place. But we tend to see peace as absence. We tend to define peace by what it's not. And I think back in this first century Jewish scene, they were seeing peace more like how we see peace today as well. As those dopamine levels were rising, they were defining peace the way that we do today in the 21st century. And so as they're cheering and celebrating this arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem, they're anticipating and expecting him to bring peace. 
but a peace is an absence. The absence of the Roman Empire, the absence of the enemy military, the absence of the oppressive outsiders. But I think we see that Jesus' understanding of peace is different to the crowds that were there in that scene today, on that day. And it's different to ours as well today. See, in Luke's telling of this same story, he tells us that the Jesus followers of this, this pr- pr- parade, this procession, they follow him all the way into the city. But as Jesus approaches the city, he does something that, uh, that Luke talks about in his telling. He says, Jesus cries. He looks out over that city and he weeps. And reading this, you might think, really? After all of this, after all this build up, after the, the crowds and the palm branches and the singing and the donkey, Jesus breaks down and weeps. Why? Well, the problem is that the people don't understand what real peace is. See, in John's telling, he says this, he has Jesus saying these words, If you, O Jerusalem, had only recognised on this day the things that make for peace. Which, of course, brings us to a question to finish with, really. What makes for peace? Is peace the way that we've kind of been defining it up until now? Is peace just the absence of bad things? Or is there more to God's peace than that? See, it's not just about the absence of something. It's about the absence achieved by the presence. It's about the presence of love. Notice the Palm Sunday story isn't about the exit, is it? It's not about all the Romans running away. It's about an entrance. It's not about the removal of something bad. It's about the arrival of something better. It's about the presence of grace. The Greek word that's usually used for peace is irene, which means the joining together of two disparate parts. It's this idea or this understanding or this picture of peace that isn't a subtraction. It's not about taking things away. It's about addition. It's about bringing things back together. It's the presence of hope. It's less about what Jesus will give to us, more about who Jesus will be for us. And that's what these people missed in that day, in that story. It's sometimes what we miss as well, isn't it? Because the peace that Jesus brings is so often slow and quiet and unassuming. But when we treat peace like the absence of something, and as something that has to happen right now, right here, in your face, so everyone can know. And that we have to force it, even violently, if necessary. And that's not the peace of God. That's the peace that was brought about by the Maccabees. That's the peace, peace, that was brought about by the Roman Empire. That peace never lasts. That's not the peace that Jesus brings. Jesus isn't here to do what's predicted in people's brains. And so there's this move from expectation to disappointment. All the people in that crowd there that day had their own understanding, their own story of what Messiah was going to do and who Messiah was going to be. That he was going to chase out the Roman Empire or he was going to go to the temple and clear out all of the hypocrisy and all the politics of the day. He was going to get rid of all of that sort of stuff. But from that heightened dopamine level, all those people received that drop, that crash, all that energetic excitement, that buzz, that earthquake that was going on within the city, changes into frustration and anger and exploding at the dinner table for no reason whatsoever. The triumph becomes trial, and the trial becomes execution. Jesus entered that city, carried on a donkey, but he leaves that city carrying a cross. That is not what anyone in that crowd was expecting that day. Why? 
Because this isn't the king they were expecting. Because Jesus redefines power and redefines peace. He doesn't come like a political king because then he'd have come into the city on a big impressive war horse. He doesn't come as a warrior king because then he'd have ridden in on a chariot. Instead he comes as this suffering servant riding humbly on a donkey. And I think there's something really important for all of us here that I don't want us to miss from this story. And it's that God doesn't intend to meet our expectations. God intends to meet our needs. And those two things can be very different. See, that, that crowd that day came for a festival, but they can't face the funeral. That crowd came for the celebration, but they're not hanging around for the crucifixion. That crowd is willing to sing, but they're not prepared to suffer. How about you today? What are you going to do with this kind of people?